All right, if you're anything like me, you hate running out of food on a trip. It's like a big fear, and so I'm I'm a big fan of snacks during an adventure, and one of my absolute favorite go-to snacks are wonderful pistachios. You may be familiar with pistachios and the brand Wonderful Pistachios, but if you're not, they are one of the highest protein nuts out there. One ounce serving of Wonderful Pistachios is six grams of protein. That's 10% of your daily value. It also includes nine essential amino acids, and they come with a ton of different flavors, varieties. There's a spicy version, there's lightly salted, there's no salted, there's so many, and every time I go on an adventure, I not even lying, I take an entire bag with me. And what's cool too, I love having the wonderful pistachio in shell because then that almost gives me something to do and focus on as I'm paddling or biking through the really monotonous parts of the adventure. Every great adventure is going to have plenty of boring moments and it's nice to have something to do and also something that is giving you some fuel like wonderful pistachios. So they're one of my favorite adventure snacks, favorite road trip snacks, and definitely leave me feeling better than a lot of other snacks you can turn to. So if you want to learn more about how to fuel your next adventure with wonderful pistachios, go to wonderful pistachios.com to learn more. Hey folks, I am uh, going to sound a little bit different for this intro. I'm recording this from the closet of a hotel room in Seattle. So this week I've been running around with my day job uh, interviewing some really cool people for the stuff I do with them. And one of them is an adventure legend, uh, more of a sports legend, but kind of crosses over new adventure. I'll release more information about that when uh, the episode that I'm doing with work comes out. But anyway, that was in Aspen. And then today I'm in Seattle to do another interview and uh, just been running around. But I forgot my podcasting equipment at home, so I'm doing this on my phone. So it might sound a little different. Uh, I'm a little cramped in here, but it's uh, hopefully it doesn't sound too bad. But before we jump into today's episode, you might remember with Monday's episode with Jennifer McConaughey that she has a book, Go Multisport, talking about, you know, exploring your world, adding fun by combining different adventure sports. And we did a book giveaway. A bunch of y'all reached out to be in the drawing. Well, we will have a drawing now of who that is. So of all the people that signed up, I, I put you all in a bucket grabbed a random name just so that everyone had a chance who was listening in different time zones. And so the winner is, can I get a drum roll, please? Never mind. The winner is Sean Jedgetts. Sean, I hope I pronounced that last name uh, okay, but you are the winner. I'll reach out and get your address and make sure the book gets to you and all that. Uh, but thank you so much. Anytime we have an author, we're going to do something like this just because, you know, it's fun, helps get the word out. Is, you know, I enjoy raising awareness for these books. It's a great way to engage with our, just hear more about their stories. We can only share so much in an hour on our show, but our guests are so full of knowledge. I'm so fascinated by them. And, and a lot of them do thankfully have a book that we can read or listen to um, on an audio book and, and get to know them a little bit better. And talking about just an incredible guest, uh, this episode, this throwback with Brian Asher, I remember is one of my favorite episodes of all time. Time because Brian is doing what seems to be the impossible, traveling all over the world, every country in the world, in fact, on a teacher salary. I'm married to a teacher. I know the plights. I know the struggle. I know the immense amount of pressure and expectations and also not getting paid that much for it. So the fact that he was able to do this uh, and continues to do really cool things, I find him and his kind of way of view in life so incredibly inspiring. And to this day, Brian is a good friend, and we've had him on before. So I hope you enjoy this episode. I hope it helps you expand what's possible for your adventure world. And again, thank you so much to everybody that uh, reached out trying to get in the book drawing. But hopefully this audio, again, isn't terrible. The episode itself is a lot better, so... Yeah, let's go ahead and dive in. All right, folks, uh, oh, just an awesome episode today. There's a lot I don't know about this story because obviously there's a lot to it. So I'm excited to talk to uh, Brian Asher about literally traveling the world, every country except for one, and we'll talk about that. Um, an amazing story of adventure, and he is now a teacher. And of course, I, I would assume you're you're off for a little while, so you got some time to talk to me. 
Yeah, yeah, we're teaching uh, at a distance, sending the kids assignments and doing Zoom and different things virtually now. So life is freed up a little bit, although we're shifting into kind of a new you know, a frontier here of having to teach from home and we'll see how long it lasts, but you know, definitely frees up your days a little bit more. I can imagine, man. I, I mean, what, a, what a crazy time. I mean, I know that it, honestly, every interview has started out saying that and a lot of folks don't want to talk about it, but me, I'm kind of the mindset. This is world changing. I want to mention it. You know what I mean? Sure. Sure. Yeah. It's something that I, I've never seen in my lifetime before and, you know, announcing it to the kids well, like a week and a half or so ago that they're going to be at home for a month, possibly more. Um, no one quite knows how to react. The district didn't quite know what to tell us. We're all, we're all adjusting on the fly here. Yeah. Yeah. My wife's a fourth grade teacher and it, it's just been crazy her being home every day and they're doing a lot of Skype and Zoom just mm-hmm. this week. And so, you know, starting this week, I mean, and so it's going to be interesting to see. It's been cool to see the kids, you know, recording videos and stuff, but also, wow, this is actually happening. That's what it keeps <laughs> to me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a change of pace. So, you know, you, you weren't always a teacher and I kind of want to go back if you don't mind. It's just an incredible story. Like I, I've really, when you, when I saw your email, it was just like, holy cow, this is a no brainer to me. Like <laughs> This is awesome. And I'm sure you hear that all the time. Where, where did your story start? Where did you grow up and, and were you outdoorsy and adventurous like this? Or did you discover that on your own? Sure. Yeah. My family did not spend much time in the outdoors. I played soccer, basketball, and baseball in high school, loved the team sports. And um, it started really after I finished playing college baseball first year in college. And then uh, my brother, my younger brother, invited me to work as a summer camp counselor out in Colorado. And that was the first time I'd ever really spent major time in the outdoors. Wow. In college? was, was In the college. First time. Yeah, it was awesome. the first time. I never camped. I had never run for fun. It was always punishment. Uh, I had never really done a hike besides a couple miles here and there in the summertime. And so the outdoors was completely foreign to me. I was uh, way out of my league, kind of in training school out there in Colorado the first time with basketball shorts and shoes on and sweatpants. I had no idea what I was doing and and hated it for the first couple of weeks because I was so out of my comfort zone, but then grew to love it as the first summer went on. And, and I got hooked on on peaking the, the 14ers, which we let our teenage kids in the camp out in the collegiate peaks working in Buena Vista there. And that started really getting me hooked into the outdoors. Oh man, I, I was gonna ask you where in Colorado, so in Buena Vista. I, I, I live in Denver, so not too mm-hmm. far at all, and I, mm-hmm. I venture out there all the time, just even for a quick, you know, evening stroll, just driving around. But it's funny you say that about sports, not knowing what you're doing. Same thing, man. I was in college. My first adventure in Alaska um, was the first real thing I ever did. And I remember wearing my basketball warm ups. It was the matching <laughs> tops and bottoms, like thinking that was you know, all there was to wear and those weren't waterproof or really just windbreaker outfit. And, oh, it was awful. So totally understand. <laughs> so, so you go out there and you experience it and and then what did it just, I mean, was it like starting a, starting a, a, a dynamite, just an explosion of adventures at that point? Or was it more of a it slow was, burn? Yeah, it was kind of like a, a fresh start for me on life because when you play sports growing up and then you hit a point where maybe you're not playing anymore in college and you see people maybe going towards a party atmosphere or drinking or it just wasn't my scene and so I was feeling a little lost there for about a year during college not quite knowing you know what group to fit in with and then going out there just introduced me to people that worked in Nepal or Antarctica and traveled I never left the country before until you know I was 21 so until my second summer at the summer camp and it just opened my mind all right these are people who like adventure are you know fairly athletic in a different way and um are just doing things that i never considered and it just kind of gave me this excitement and joy for life that uh it was just like kind of a second start after doing the team sports for so long wow and where was home at that point i'm sorry yeah sure home is sacramento california where i grew up and i'm actually teaching high school spanish at the same high school where i went to school which is funny how it's come full circle so i've uh lived one through 18 here in Sacramento, then been gone for a bunch of years in college and living abroad for about six years, then came back and have been living here for the last six years, teaching high school in Sacramento. 
Oh, I love it, man. I love when folks go back home to show, you know, to show what they've learned. And I saw, I was looking at your Instagram, some of your most recent pictures are Yosemite Valley. And mm-hmm. I'm sure listeners are tired of hearing me say this, but that's, that's my favorite place in the whole world. That is my heaven on earth. And Oh, uh, I love it. Yeah. I love it. I was down there a week and a half ago, the day before it closed and they closed some of the national parks here, you know, with the coronavirus. And so, um, was there, and there's nobody in the park. Got to go to the top of uh, the Mist Trail there to Nevada Falls. And who knows the next time I'll be able to be back in the park. But that's that's heaven on earth for me. <laughs> it's just Yosemite. Just uh, unparalleled to me about Yosemite and especially Yosemite mm-hmm. Valley. But anyway, man, I feel like we've just been uh, um, I'm leading folks on. And, they, and they've heard. I'm going to you know explain a little bit more in the in the intro, in the official show intro about your story. But so, you know, you, you start going places and doing these experiences and interacting with these people who have just been living an extraordinary life. What was maybe some of your first experiences traveling to other countries? I'm sure obviously had to start somewhere before hitting them all. Sure. Yeah. Junior year in college when I was 20 years old, uh, my brother, who was a Spanish major and education major, uh, said, you gotta, you gotta try going abroad. It's just gonna, you know, just fire up your engines and just give you this kind of you know, kind of enthusiasm for life when you start going to different places. And so I resisted it for a while and, and finally, you know, let him kind of talk me into, I went down to Costa Rica by myself over Christmas break for 10 days and couch surfed, which is where you stay for someone for free on their couch, maybe a mattress or something, and did it with a family that only spoke Spanish, which really pushed me to my limits. because I wasn't too good in Spanish at the time. And, uh, I was terrified for the first couple of days, but it just, it started, the terror kind of started turning into excitement as I got a little more used to it, more used to it and, and ran a, a full marathon there when I was in Costa Rica on the beach, um, on the Eastern side in the Caribbean. And, and once I got back, I, I knew I had to do more. And, uh, so that just started getting the engines burning for, you know, kind of planning the next trip and how I could get back out and have that same rush, the same feeling of just feeling totally alive and in the moment. Well, and I got to ask you this about the marathons. What What is that? You just, do you enjoy running? And, and do you, are these marathons, because you've done dozens and dozens of them, are these things that are official events or are you doing it on your own? Yeah, yeah. I've done 62 official 26.2 mile marathons. And, uh, you turned it around done... 26 to 62. <laughs> yeah, again. wow. Got it flipped around. I'd say maybe six or seven in Mexico when I was living there, maybe six or seven in Brazil when I was living there. I've done, um, I think, three or four in Europe and uh, a lot of trail marathons here in, in the West Coast. And, and now basically go out and enjoy trail running and get as much satisfaction from doing a, an awesome route in Yosemite or near Tahoe or you know near Shasta or something. So I have stopped running the official races as much and go out with friends or on my own and, and just do 10, 15, 20, 30-mile routes in, in the outdoors, which gives me as much joy as, as the races did. So how early on did the idea of visiting every country in the world start to start to materialize? Sure. Yeah. So first time I left the country, I was 20. Um, once I graduated from college at 21, I got a one-way ticket to Mexico to travel slash find a job. Um, proceeded to live abroad for the next five and a half years as I got into teaching English, translating, and working with NGOs as well. And it, it never was on my radar. I'd been to maybe 15 countries over those um, five or six years living abroad. And then I, I came back and had to kind of come home and help out with family as my brother was ill and then unfortunately passed on. Um, and that just gave me a different perspective at life that we're not all here forever. Um, we don't want to postpone our dreams. And that was what he had introduced me to was the travel, the outdoors, um, you know, taking advantage of, of your opportunities, not postponing your dreams. And it felt like it was something I needed to carry on for the two of us. And so as I worked here as a teacher in Sacramento, I'd used literally every break to go as a bu- budget backpacking traveler two places, Thanksgiving, boom, Christmas, two weeks, President's Week, February, spring break, all summer. And um, over the next six years, of five years of teaching here, I got to up to about 85 or 90 countries. And then that light bulb went on and I went, wow, if I've been to like half of the world's countries, more or less, 
I wonder if it's possible. So I'd say that was about two and a half, three years ago when the, it started getting on my radar when I was about 85 or 90 countries in. You said just two and a half or three years ago? Yeah, yeah, wow, not, not that recent. long ago. Yeah, this isn't, has, this isn't like 30 years in the making this year. No, is, no, it was wow. just loving to travel and going to new places. And I would keep track and document where I'd go. But the, the number didn't mean anything to me. It was cool. Oh, you've been to 30 or 40. But it was just the excitement of picking, you know, this summer I'm going to be in Southern Africa. You know, next summer I'm going to go all the way through Eastern Europe from Istanbul to Stockholm. It was just the, the excitement of new places. I didn't have that goal um, on my radar at all until just a couple of years ago. That's incredible. And now, now you mentioned a big inspiration was was your brother who, who passed away. Is, it, mm-hmm. um, is that, I mean, that's just you know, a lot of people don't like a huge pivotal moment for people is something when something like that happens. And and do you think that that was almost like, 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 would you be doing this if that hadn't happened? I don't know if I would. I mean, I think I would continue to travel, but it really hits home when, um, you know, you, you lose your best friend and someone that introduced you and that you plan doing these things together your whole life that, uh, you know, we just need to go forward. I was very down and depressed for a couple of months, came home, left my teaching and, you know, a job and apartment and girlfriend and everything in Brazil um, to come back home. And so it was something like, I have to go forward. And what's what's it that gives me the most peace that I, that I had the most joy doing with my brother? And it was the outdoors and the travel and just that feeling of being alive and, and you know, doing what you're passionate about. And so uh, it just came clear, I have to continue with this, not just in a little bit, but you know, in a hundred percent way, because it's an outlet that's, that's allowing me to live an inspired life for both of us and hopefully share that with other people. Oh, absolutely, man. Absolutely. So you're, you're taking advantage of, of every break that you're able to, <laughs> to do this. It sounds like, um, uh-huh. you know, I tra- I've traveled, I've not obviously traveled as much as you. I, I mean, I've gone a handful of places and I, I and I know enough to know that places surprise you. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I tell people all the time, like one of my most favorite states I've ever visited was Nebraska for some reason. Just, just it was just the right mixture of people and weather and experiences and just surprise, I guess you could say. Is there a place mm-hmm. or a few places that have been like that for you where maybe you didn't have a lot going in, like, oh, it's going to be fine, but then it was just amazing? Sure. Yeah, last, last year, I guess I should explain the reason why I've been able to jump from 90 or so to 195 yeah, countries yeah. here is that last year I took a leave of absence from teaching and uh, saved and planned and was like, all right, if I have 14 months, how can I do it? And so last year I got to 100 countries over 14 months and um, didn't come back once and stayed in regions like West Africa and went by local transportation uh, and so could could budget you know the finances a lot better taking local transport instead of always flying back to the U.S. or Europe or something. So. Uh, last year was, was an insane adventure with these 14 months. And I'd say one of the countries, um, getting to your question, that really surprised me is Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan was by far one of my top you know, three, four countries in the world I've ever been to. And uh, not for everyone would I recommend it, but I mean, for me, it checked all the boxes. It was extremely authentic. You know, you don't see any other foreigners or travelers there. Uh, the outdoors is is insanely beautiful. I think, you know, picture kind of Nepal with some of the biggest mountains in the world, but 0.001% of the people that go there. Um, the people, um, I always love to share that literally everything was free for me in Pakistan, which I've never had in any other country in wow. the world because during the 21, 22 days I was there, they would not let me pay for anything. I would walk into a shop, a market, a little you know, sandwich place, and they'd know that I wasn't from there and say, no, 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 like, it's on me. The Quran teaches us we want foreigners and visitors to be treated well, treat you, treat you with respect. And if you, know, you ever have the chance to go home and share what it's really like in Pakistan, this is the image that we want to give you. And so that happened time after time after time, getting invited into people's homes to stay with them. Um, Just that combination of no foreigners, the outdoors is beautiful, it's rugged, Um, culture jumps out to you when you're on the streets, the way that people received me, um, that I didn't have to spend almost anything in three weeks. It was uh, was one of the countries that people don't know, but it it was just amazing, one of my favorite countries ever. 
Wow. That, that, I mean, those are some great reasons. And I've actually heard that a lot from the bike touring community, like the world cyclists, they are saying, gosh, you know, like Pakistan and even Iran and Mm-hmm. It just is so underrated, and there's almost this desire to change the change the perspective that most mm-hmm. people go in thinking, and it's it's like this overcorrection that's really awesome. Like you said, you don't have to pay anything, and for someone who's such a cheapskate like me, that sounds incredible. <laughs> me so. too, as a teacher, <laughs> you got to save yeah. your money when you yeah. can. <laughs> Absolutely. That being said, like that, uh, you know, bringing that up, teaching. Oh my gosh, you get to come back to school. You know, when you're there, or when you know, when you came back after that year of absence, and just the richness that you probably get to teach with at that point. I mean, does it add to your ability to teach at all, or does it take away? Because I know sometimes it spoils you to where it's like, oh, I don't want to go back to my normal. Life, you know, <laughs> I'd say it definitely adds to what you can give to the students. As far as you know, you could talk about it and read about it, or point out things in a textbook, or I could share all of my own firsthand personal experiences, photos, videos from YouTube, work them into the lesson plan. And so I know how I was when I was 15 or 16, and I didn't necessarily love Spanish. And so I try to make it in a way that's you know interesting for them. Hey, this guy's living it, doing it. They know where I'm going during my next break. They know that Thanksgiving break, I was in Syria, Libya, and Algeria, going to you know three of the last countries in the world for me. They're keeping tabs on me. So I feel like when you can connect with a teacher or a student, then that makes it come alive. And so I definitely try to do that with the kids. I, are you the type that can get going on personal stories and kind of take up the whole class period talking about uh, it? Yeah, sometimes you get going. And if they're interested, <laughs> I'll go off on it. But yeah, I mean, you do a combination of what you need to do and what you love sharing about. But um, I feel like what I remember about my teachers is how they were as people more than chapter 4A, the preterite past tense, you know. So I, I feel like, you know, that life side of it is huge. So I, I don't mind getting off on that. I, yeah, man, that's that's what life's about. And I'm sure you can teach lessons, you know, from the heart at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, gosh, so... So what about the flip side? Has there been any place that, I, you know, I don't want to turn it negative necessarily, but a place that was like, well, this might be a little overly advertised, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't as advertised. Hmm. Good question. So this last year, literally I've been to the 90 easier, more touristy countries, and I was in the 100 harder countries in the world. So, I mean, for me, like I'll, I'll throw out one like Dubai, for example, which I went through four or five times. It all depends on your style. I mean, what you like to do, what your priorities are. But I'm, I'm such an outdoors lover of the mountains and being able to get out and roam freely and also be in places that are more budget destinations. And, you know, you come into a big city like Dubai where everything's kind of artificial and built up. And I think it's called the Burj Khalifa, the biggest skyscraper in the world. You go over and look at it and, you know, it costs I don't know, it's 80 or 100 or $120 to go to the top or something. Oh, wow. You know, and I'm used to paying four dollars for a bus ticket across you know like (laughs) 18 hours of pakistan or something or maybe someone's buying it for me even and so uh you know when you come to places that are kind of more city centered or a little more artificial i'd say um if you love shopping and malls that's for you but you know people probably listening to this podcast maybe dubai is a nice break but not a place that i would choose for example to spend a lot of time in yeah, uh, you know, you're in just like you said, the folks that are listening to this show are going to more or less agree with that. Gosh, man, it's just that's such a daunting goal to most people. I'm trying to wrap my head around it. And and mm-hmm. the, I'm looking through your pictures now and just thinking gosh, so many countries vary so much. It's like visiting the different states. Like you can visit Rhode Island and Alaska, technically on paper you checked them both off, but how do how do you experience these countries that you're going to with such a varying degree of, you know, cultural depth as well as natural beauty that you're, you love so much and, you know, the vastness of these places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Looking, I mean, before I took off last year, I had maps out in my room almost every day trying to picture how, how is this going to happen? Like working together a hundred countries in the world, different regions, 
Uh, I started in the Caribbean, then went over to the Pacific to some of the most remote countries in the world with a Nauru and a Tuvalu and Kiribati that have maybe one or two flights a week and that the runway turns into a playground for the rest of the, you know, the week for the entire country to go out there and play to over in Central Asia, you know, going down the Silk Road is kind of the tail end of the Himalayas into Africa and the Middle East. There's, there's so much diversity. And I guess for me, one of the things I love and I think almost any traveler will tell you, it's, it's about the people. It's about who you meet. And I stayed through booking Airbnb, couch surfing, um, a friend of a friend, a Peace Corps volunteer. I stayed with local families um, as much as I could. And that not only save costs, but instead of going to a cold hotel room or a fancy chain hotel that you spend $200 a night, I'm spending 10 to 15 to $20 a night in a bedroom in a local family's house. And they are sharing with you their culture, recommending where to go, sharing meals with you. And that's huge. Like It's pretty dry if you just go take pictures of monuments or the famous things in a city or even nature, which I love. Like You need the people. And so I tried to meet and interact with as many local people in these countries. And that's it's great to look through like WhatsApp right now and see people from nearly every country in the world in my contacts in WhatsApp and to be able to have memories with them. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. Every year, the number and scope of data breaches worldwide is rising. The likelihood of your own data getting breached is always increasing. Your data, location history, social security number, all that leaks, and people are out there looking for that information and willing to pay for it. The good news is that you have the right to protect your privacy and request that data brokers delete information they hold about you because it could happen without you even knowing it. The bad news is it would take you years to do it manually, just one time, and you need to repeat the process every few months. And this is how Incogni can help you put an end to this problem. They conduct repeated removal requests, which means that whenever a new record pops up on a data broker site, Incogni will automatically take care of it. The whole process is automated. All you got to do is create an account and tell them what personal data information you want to be removed, grant them the right to work with you, and they will contact data brokers on your behalf, and then just kick back and let them work. If you'd like to let Incogni help you remove that data repeatedly for peace of mind, go to incogni.com slash adventure sports. That's I-N-C-O-G-N-I dot com slash adventure sports. You can use the discount code adventure sports as well. I'd say at least go there, learn some more information. You know, if you're something you're interested in, they have a subscription plan for as low as $6.49 a month. Go to the show notes and you can see all that information. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. Oh, man. Yeah, that's that's pretty remarkable. And, you know, there'll be a time you'd scroll back through these pictures and, and, and all these experiences and think, wow, I, I can't even remember that day. But this picture <laughs> brings it back up. What mm-hmm. what? What what are your goals when you when you go to a place like as far as how much time to spend there and how to incorporate those those much more realistic experiences? What is that process for you? Sure. Well, uh, I, last year I, I traveled fairly quickly. I think anyone who's trying to visit every country, I mean, it's it's such a daunting goal, and to go to so many places, you know, you want to come back to a lot of places. But um, for as far as time and. Uh, each country, some of the islands you can see really well. Like, let's say Nauru, it's 13 miles around the entire island. So I rented a motorbike and biked it 10 times and also ran around it once. So, I mean, I saw the island, you know, yeah, you inside <laughs> and out over like the 72 hours I was there because there's two flights a week that go in and out. So, um, and then other countries like last year, the Philippines, Mongolia, Russia, Pakistan, I'd spend two to three weeks, Nepal as well, in those countries. Um, so in the past, I always used my school breaks. So it was Israel and Jordan for 10 days or something and, you know, countries that I could see fairly well, South Korea for, you know, eight, nine days. So um, last year was a little bit faster of a pace, but I did slow down on a lot of countries that I felt like I, I wanted to see more. And I've got a big list of ones I want to go back and see as well. What is at the top of that list? Ones that I like to go back and yeah, see. Yeah. Being an outdoors lover, a Himalayas. The Himalayas jumps out right off the bat. Pakistan, which I mentioned, Nepal. I got to do a couple of the treks in Nepal, but I mean, that's just 
like right, you know, right up your wheelhouse if you love the outdoors. Nepal, um, Patagonia and Chile and Argentina, I'd love to go back and see more of. I think the the Middle East, like Afghanistan, Iran, if I could take kind of a more proper you have to do a tour as an American of Iran would be wonderful to see these countries that are often misunderstood. Northern India with Ladakh, which is in the northern part, kind of near Kashmir and the Himalayas as well. But the mountains, the outdoors, that's that definitely stands out. You know, I'm I'm a little bit not a little bit, I'm pretty blown away by just the ability to 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 chase this goal and to accomplish it. And uh of course, the the one that you haven't visited, what you gotta get into North Korea? No, I'm just <laughs> no, I, no, I know Korea. it's obvious reasons, but is there any do you keep that on your radar? Is it kinda like we'll see what oh, happens? Oh yeah. I mean, I was gonna go in October to do it's. I mean, the, the the official real tour that enters the country, Americans been banned for I think about three three and a half years, unfortunately. Since kind of a young guy took some propaganda poster off the wall and ended up dying of trauma and things. So we've been off the the real tour list. You can go to the DMZ, and several friends have done this. It counts. It's not ideal, but when you go there and visit the Blue House conference room, you do enter North Korea by several yards probably so that is the only option we have and uh due to health issues with the swine flu in october my tour was canceled and it's been canceled you know for obvious reasons here with the coronavirus uh more recently so i'd love to do the legit tour but even the dmz tour would be the other possible option but both are off the table right now so it's it's just a waiting game to finish the last one <laughs> it's almost more interesting to say, I've been to every country in the world except one. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? I know. Sounds like you really messed up or something, but I didn't mess up. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't get to it because of these, you know, different health you know, yeah, issues. Just, and, just, there's but... one I didn't want to see. Just one. No, it's, uh, it's, yeah, I don't, I have no doubt that in the, in the, that the, your, your level of, your ability to figure this stuff out and also your willingness <laughs> to, to, to wait and be patient, you'll, you'll get there. I think that's a big one too that people don't, realize is the planning and logistics like they see your cool pictures and things but planning and doing it independently on a teacher's salary living out of a carry-on backpack for 420 days last year like it is insane the number of hours you spend every day researching visas and borders and you know like customs and like how do you get into the hardest countries and local transportation like the logistics is insane so i'll put that out there too that people don't realize how hard it is to do all this independently. (laughs) It's really hard. It's really, you have to be very passionate about it. And, you know, you have guests all the time that are passionate about what they do, but like a casual traveler would not go to the last 50 countries. Like they just wouldn't, it's so much work and effort to get into, let's say countries, you know, from 140 to 190 or 193 or so. Like it's, it is a lot of effort to get into these countries. All right, well, let me ask you this. What can you walk us through a process where one of these, maybe it's remote, maybe it's just so infrequently visited, maybe the visa process is hard. What was one of those experiences like? Because I always love to say, hey, what is Instagram not telling? What's between the lines <laughs> of the pictures, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll put uh, Nauru out there. It's the least visited country in the world. It's the island I mentioned that you can get around 13 miles. Um, there was one guy who is the contact, and you email him, and then about a week later, he emails you back. And so I started the process about two months before. It's the only island in the Pacific, island nation, that you need a visa to get into. Visa meaning you can't just show up and get stamped in and get a visa on arrival, for example. And so I, I started emailing this guy, having heard stories about it from other friends, you know, months before I started going. And you know, you send one right after he sends one back to you, and then you wait another week or so, and then you know you're missing this document, or you're missing a letter from your employer. You know, you need to have this, you know, other, you know, photocopies of your passport and things, other pages, and so. I'm, you know, in the Caribbean, making my way through the first few countries, getting all these documents to him. And literally the first three months I'm working on this. And finally, when I'm getting down to my last couple of countries in the Pacific, everything's squared away. And he sends me my visa confirmation and I'm able to get in. So I get one of the biweekly flights that goes up. I think it was from Fiji. It's just the hub in the Pacific up to Nauru in on a Tuesday morning, out on a Thursday. So I'm there for two and a half, three days and uh, just squeezed it in before I had to hop over to my next region, which is Central Asia. So that one took me 
two to three months, and that's just one. <laughs> you know, Africa is full of visa, full, you know, visa requiring countries, and every single one's another process to figure out how to get into these countries. Wow, and and that with booking flights, and flights are not cheap to these places. I'm sure it does mm-hmm. get. Was there was there a point where you said I just do not want to finish these last fifty <laughs> countries? Or something? Uh, well, Africa was really the tipping point. There's 54 countries in Africa. I had to get to 41. I'd been to 13 before last year. And so I'm looking at you know 41 countries. A lot of them are notorious for hard to get into. And I'm not getting them from visa processes here in the U.S. where you send it into D.C., you got months to wait, you pay someone like a service. I don't, you know, if I can do it, I'm going to do it on the, on the go in, in the country. So I'd block out let's say a week in Abidjan Ivory Coast because I've heard stories from friends that you can get visas for Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso pretty easily supposedly in Abidjan but there's one guy there he might show up certain days not other days he's going to tell you it's you know maybe two or three weeks for the visa process and but you know there's an express treatment which is you don't know if it's legit or if it's kind of bribing but like you know, you you got to like negotiate with these guys to be able to get visas for your upcoming countries. And, you know, Africa is blocking out weeks at a time to spend in capital cities to get visas for your upcoming countries while you're just kind of sweating it out in these not so comfortable embassy waiting rooms, waiting for the wed, one head honcho guy to come back and deal with you. So it's it's definitely a task and patience and you better have a sense of humor as well. <laughs> Yeah, you better have a good attitude. And it sounds like you have a very <laughs> uh, optimistic and positive outlook on things. I would tell you, I'd I'd probably get shot at some point after mouthing off of, of being hot <laughs> and sweaty for three weeks, and, and then my travels would be over. So <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. you have to always remember. And I, I, you know, I've heard it from other guests on your program. Like we choose to be out there. You know, we're fortunate and privileged enough to choose to do these adventures. And if you want normalcy, comfort and you know routine then you stay at home and when you choose to be out there in you know guinea Bissau or you know senegal or guinea or you know benin or ivory coast waiting for embassies to open up or someone to show up then you know you, you've made that choice so you better be all in on it and be patient and uh, be optimistic like you said has luck played any sort of role for you would you say uh, i don't really kind of attribute too much of it to luck i think that when you work really hard and you're passionate and you're kind to people and you treat people well, when you come into these countries, I've been so warmly received in countries with such negative reputations through the news. And so, I mean, I guess you could attribute a little bit of it to luck, but I, I like to think that when you when you treat people well, when you're open, when you're not the all-knowing American that comes in, but you honestly want to learn about their culture and you listen to them and ask them questions, you're vulnerable because you're lost, don't know where you're going to stay, need help, or asking about their family, you know, their, their traditions. They generally want to help you out and bring you in. And um, so I feel like that's that's been a key factor is the human kindness I've received everywhere I go. And that's that's every country around the world. Wow. Kindness and respect are key, it sounds like. Mm-hmm. What, what, you know, that is obviously an enormous lesson. What would you say the biggest lesson you've learned or the biggest way and or the biggest way this has changed you as a person? Mm-hmm. Well, I think one is huge is you come back and you can't take for granted the things that we have. When you, when you go to the tap and you can turn on water, you can drink. You know, I had to purify water for 14 months last year, basically every country, um, when you when you see just how much space and the yards and the jobs and the you know normal job like teaching, if I'm hearing teachers complain about their salaries, you know I I was visiting rural schools in Afghanistan and Pakistan and you know have taught in Brazil making four times less than I do now, and it just gives you an appreciation for the things that we have and we're fortunate. My friend always says we won the lottery, you know we grew up in one of the, the strongest economies in the world and you know we need to be grateful. And when you see that and feel it firsthand, then you come back and you really appreciate it. So that's that's a big one. And I think the the human kindness side and that we're more similar than you think. People want to have a better life. They want to spend time with friends and family. They want to share. They want to love and be loved. And and when you go places at the core, we're really all all the same. And you might look at people's clothing or the markets or the size of their home and say, wow, it's very different than, you know, suburban Denver or Sacramento or wherever you may live. Um, But people are the same and people want to help you. 
uh, people have helped me just millions of times. I go into countries usually planning a day or two at a time and you know, having people just guide me, show me where to go, help me out with things I'm confused with. People are good and the vast majority of people will help you. Um, you know, so that's, those are definitely a couple lessons that, that really stick with me and I, I try to share with my students and, and people that ask me this kind of question. Yeah, and and I apologize for I try to be an interviewer that doesn't ask the same questions all the time, but no, I don't no. always get someone that's been to every country in the world except one. So it, it's just so much to it that is so fascinating and so and it's the basics really for for me that I find so incredibly interesting about this. Uh, do you have any stories that could help illustrate that? I know that might be trying to. It's kind of like trying to pick a favorite child, so <laughs> and it's it's very hard. But with millions of stories, literally, that you have, oh, anything yeah. at all that can illustrate those points? Sure. Yeah, I'll give an example. Uh, Papua New Guinea, one of the least visited, most untouched countries in the world, it's over kind of near the Philippines, above Australia. There, a country that I had heard, you know, is is, is dangerous and scary, and it used to be cannibals, and there's still people who are out living that have almost barely had contact with the Western world. And so I flew into Port Moresby, the capital, and then went up to the Highlands, which is kind of the real cultural highlight of the country where they have different festivals. And so I, I went up there and I often have maybe one place screenshotted on my phone for an idea of where I might stay. And so we got off of this little plane in the Highlands of Papua New Guinea. And, uh, you know, the airport was under construction of just a runway strip. And I looked out and there's like about a thousand local people just staring at me. <laughs> there was no, there was no building. There was no tunnel. It was just like open land. And I just all of a sudden wow. kind of went, whoa, like I don't feel comfortable. And I usually feel pretty good. And like I'm out of my comfort zone. And so I looked kind of around and tried to see if there's anyone else on my plane that looked like they might be a foreigner. And I saw, I saw a guy who looked like he might be European or American. I went over to him and he was a missionary. And he had been working there. He was from Poland. He'd been there for 15 years. No, no, like, don't worry about it. Like, just come with me. I'll take care of you. Like, don't, don't worry about it. You know, I know it's probably a shock for you to be up here and just come with me. So he took me to their missionary kind of center where they live there. And one of the local missionaries, Father Thomas, who I still keep in touch with today, uh, just took me under his wing and he had me for the next week. And he took me out to these rural villages to be able to see how the villages were doing, the communities were doing, their schools. And, and I couldn't have had a better time in a place that for those first few minutes, I was just absolutely terrified to show up, didn't have a place to stay, didn't know where I was going to walk, who was going to help me. And there I am in a, in a missionary kind of center going out to these rural communities in the bush where they just absolutely loved having Father Thomas and I come in to visit them. He'd kind of give a mass, give a service, see how the communities were doing, see how their water projects were going to have, you know, pure water that they were having purified and things so they could drink. And, and, uh, you know, it's just countless examples like that of where you're going in scared, unknown, not sure what's going to happen to warmly received, helped, taken in and just a really memorable experience. And that's the first time I think you've mentioned since we've been talking feeling uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. how, how I mean, obviously, I'm sure it's just one of the major questions people ask is, "Isn't that dangerous?" And so, <laughs> what what role does danger play in an achievement like this? You know what I mean? Obviously, there's going to be situations, but you mm -hmm. know, what what how do you process that? And what was it like for you on that side? Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, when you think of South Sudan, Central African Republic, Yemen, Afghanistan, Papua New Guinea, these countries, a lot of times you think of dangerous places. Um, so I would get there and then, like I said, kind of stay with the local families as often as I could. And that's really key. If I could have some local family person, if they're meeting you where you're getting in, if you know how to get to their place, and then they will kind of take care of you and help you know where you can go and where you can't go. And so I don't try to put myself in harm's way. Sometimes, you know, sunset is your time to finish your activities. You know, if you're in countries that or cities that aren't that aren't that safe. But I feel like you gather the opinion of 
local people who are looking out for you, typically a family you're staying with, maybe it's a taxi driver, maybe it's a few people you meet on a bus, maybe it's people on the street, and you kind of gather together their opinions, and they all want to help you and see you safe and have a good experience. And I'm going to follow what they say. You know, you can go here, you should take a taxi after this hour, you really should be in by sunset. You know, I wouldn't go into these villages outside of the city, and so I'm, I'm taking the locals kind of combined word of mouth, knowing that they want my best interests to guide what my experience will be like in each country. Great piece of advice. You know, it's, it's instant information. I tell folks, all that. I mean, I, I'm a huge believer in being trained and kind of just not trying to reinvent the wheel in every, in every mm-hmm. way. So that with all these literally hundreds of places you go, that's just had to have accelerated this uh, the ability to do this and what a wonderful tip thank you for sharing that sure sure i I had a question in mind but now i'm trying to think i'm just i'm blown away by this and i'm looking at your picture so it's hard it's hard to (laughs) it's hard not to be inspired at the very least no i'll share one more thing sure as well while you're thinking um i know that like your podcast and other podcasts that i've had when you're out on these i think people don't realize how much of your life you spend in transportation when you're on the road um, you know, like I said, they see the glory moments, but literally I'm spending three to 15 hours every day in transportation to get to the next country. To, you're not only like having to get to the capitals of the countries, but you want to get out and see interesting things, which are often, often in right, remote right. areas or areas that are way outside. And so, you know, like having your podcast, for example, to be able to have some travel and some just positive influence and kind of a feeling of being at home and adventures talking to you through your ears is really nice because you're in the moment and you're sweating it out. And like, I remember going by bus across a good region of the Sahara last year from Mali down to or for Burkina Faso up into Mali. And you're there, and you're seeing, there's like six people across and there's, you know, people sitting on gas tanks in the middle of the bus and you're just shoulder to shoulder with people. It's like, 120, 130 degrees, and they're cracking the windows just a little bit so the sand doesn't come in, blowing the windows, and you're just sweating your guts out. And like, you need to shut your whole system off. <laughs> and so, having a, yeah. a podcast or something to listen to that will just take you out of the moment, even if it's for 40 minutes or an hour or an hour or two of like a 14 hour bus day across the Sahara is is a lifesaver. So I want to thank you for having, having your podcast and you've had a lot of cool people on it that, um, you know, when you're out there alone on the road is really a lifesaver. Like I said, to just have some kind of positive thing to turn to when you're in a day where you're kind of suffering it out in a huge transportation type day. Wow. That's, that means a lot. Thank you. And, and, you know, we do hear from folks all the time that say, you know, I'm, I'm rowing across the ocean. I have internet for today because I landed on an island that has it and I wanted to let you know I've been listening to the show or I'm biking across South America or hitchhiking and it's just so awesome to hear that folks um that folks use it as inspiration is almost as fuel to keep going a lot of oh, the times. yeah it makes you feel like you're not alone when a lot of times oh. you're out there on your own fighting it you know, on a solo adventure and just that sense of community is really helpful it's really helpful I, absolutely. I, I think I, I tell my wife all the time and anyone, it's the most powerful force in the world to me personally is knowing I'm not alone in a situation. And that just is instantly a game changer for anything I'm ever going through when someone is willing to admit it and say, I'm do I'm going through this too. And, and it just, oh, what a, what, how invigorating that is. That's mm-hmm. fantastic. And that's so, what you're doing every week. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, well, no problem. It's my pleasure. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I sit at my desk a lot if, for, for you guys to be out there, you guys and girls to be out there. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, it did remind me of what I wanted to ask, you know, you said a lot of people don't realize just how much travel is in you know, is, or just how much transportation time is mm-hmm. in travel. What are some other misconceptions about this that you think uh, folks don't really understand until until they do something like this themselves? Yeah, I think people see the glorious side of it. You know, like you just said, um, I've done a couple like Good Morning shows on TV, and oh, I'm so jealous. And I know <laughs> that I'm like, man, if you were with me for two days last year, staying where I'm staying, like maybe you're jealous if you spend three or four hundred dollars a day but i'm spending like 20 to 40 dollars a day and so the version i do it you're not gonna be that jealous because it's gonna be pretty uncomfortable yeah um no starbucks uh, out there (laughs) (laughs) yeah let's see i think that you have to be really rich to travel as well i think that's another big one that 
you know, I have never had my parents pay for a cent of anything and have done it on an English teacher abroad salary, which is way less than I make now. And now on a high school teacher, you know, here in the U.S. is salary. So I think that's a huge one. People think you have to be absolutely super rich. And I, I tell people, like, you know, if I bought a new truck last year for thirty or $40,000, like no one would have blinked because it's, oh, your fifth year teaching. Congrats. You got a new car or a new truck. Yeah. But because I chose to go out and live in a backpack and stay with local people's homes and go to a hundred countries, people think, oh, he's you know insane or he's crazy or, you know, he's all of a sudden got a ton of money or, you know, this guy's a rich guy or something like it, it's what you prioritize. And so I think that's a huge one. And, and, you know, doing it, it depends on your style that travel does not have to be luxurious. It's never been luxurious for me. Like the idea of having a, you know, kind of like a bracelet on your wrist for unlimited drinks or, you know, hanging out at the beach. That's just, that's being a tourist. And I've never felt like a tourist. I've always felt like a traveler or an adventurer. And honestly, it's real. You know, I meet people because I'm doing things how they do it. I'm not doing it being escorted away in a car or a truck or in a bubble on a, on a beach in, you know, Vallarta or Cancun or Cabo San Lucas or something like I'm taking a bus across Mexico or with the people on the Chepe train going across Chihuahua and the Copper Canyon, like I'm doing how the local people travel. And so that's, that's huge. And it makes it so much more authentic to me. Um, so I'd say that's one of the big misconceptions is people think it's glorious with fancy clothes and fancy hotels and all you can eat. And like, that's not the style I've ever done. And I feel like the style that I do and a lot of my friends do is it allows you to get an in to how the people there live. And that's, that's one of my favorite things to experience. Mm, man, I just can't tell you how much I, I want to reiterate every, every point you're making. And it's absolute fact, you know, a lot of people say they're jealous and a lot of people, you know, want to do this, but you know, the way they want to do it is going to be thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, mm -hmm. more than it has to be. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I, I really encourage folks. This is, you know, we're a bunch of dirt bags that listen to this show. So we're, <laughs> we're all about that. And, uh, and me, oh my gosh, I mean, I slept in the back of my truck a week ago and that's just because, <laughs> you know. I'm out there. I don't want to pay for a hotel or anything, of course. And, and it's just a great experience. You know, it's, it's those kinds of things I think just yeah. really open up your world and really make things possible because you don't need an $80,000 sprinter van to go camping. Mm -hmm. I don't know mm -hmm. where people got that idea, but mm -hmm. you know, you don't need that. You don't need all these things. And so, uh, so, so for, for someone, I mean, this is just such a great scenario because you're a teacher and for folks in the States, especially, Lots of teachers. My wife's a teacher. We lived off her income for a long time as I was finding my way. And, mm -hmm. you know, you make it seem so possible and doable for people. What are your pieces of advice for folks who are maybe afraid, never traveled much, um, never been out of the country much, but want to and mm -hmm. don't have a whole lot of money to throw at it? Sure. Yeah, I'd say keep in mind that there's five to 10 countries that are the same cost as the U.S. And then there's 185, 190 countries that are cheaper than our country. And it could be five to 10 times cheaper than our country. And so I think people tend to go to Western Europe, which is one of the more expensive places in the world. But if you go to Latin America, if you go to Southeast Asia, um, if you go to most of the developing world, things will be much, much cheaper. And what we make in a month here could last you if you're you know kind of more of a budget traveler like a lot of listeners probably are on this type of show would um you know could last you a long time so i'd say uh know the places are much cheaper than the u.s in general and also if you can have a local contact where you're going i think that breaks a lot of the fear in the beginning when you're first wanting to go somewhere people are afraid because it's unknown and it's scary and if you have a friend of a neighbor, if you have a friend of a friend, you have a distant relative, you have any contact that's in any country, that's really a great jumping off spot. And maybe that's somewhere like Mexico, because we have so many people that are from Mexico or have you know, family from Mexico here. That's where I started. One of my first couple countries was in Guadalajara. Um, so if you have a local contact there, that's huge. Because someone that can show you around will break that ice and then hopefully you'll start gaining a little bit of confidence um, for going more on your own. But if you know someone in the country, that's a great place to start. I, uh, I really enjoy that. And I was going to ask you, that's an amazing piece of advice. How do you do that? So it is just 
thinking about who you know, maybe looking at your social media, who is my friend, who knows who, who's from another country, mm-hmm. and, and then going from there. That, I mean, honestly, my first trip, it was exactly that. A friend of mine was from Alaska, and then we you had the connection right there. And so mm-hmm. it was, that's a great place to start. And, and honestly, like all the other reasons you said, you get just an instant uh, education on where to go, where not to go, and, and what to do, and what to really mm-hmm. see. So that's mm-hmm. that's just fantastic. You know, for someone who has been everywhere except one country, <laughs> as we as we keep saying, what's next for you? Like, where do, where do you go from here? This is the only Earth we know of. So know. what do you do? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, a lot of a lot of friends are like, "What's your next adventure?" And I don't know if there's going to be a goal that's quite going to be on the same level of this. I haven't quite planned it out, but I mean, in my mind, I, I picture going because I love traveling. Is I mean, there's countries like India. I spent two and a half years living in Brazil, but still a huge country. I'll say India, Brazil, um, Australia, Russia. You get these uh, countries. They're just massive. And if you've been there for several weeks, there's China. There's so much that you want to go back and see. So I picture returning to you know, the countries that you sampled, but you want to see more of um, and, and explain more of the outdoors, definitely. And I think a huge one is is being able to share it with people and being able to share your story, whether it's podcasts or making videos or you know speaking for different groups in your community or sharing with groups of students at your school or other teachers um not wanting it to be a selfish motive but to be able to have it to bless other people and help other people out so continue to do it and also share it with people and um that's that's definitely big on my plate right now is to be able to share your story with others wow just fantastic well you know, in speaking about how, how to share and sharing your story, where can folks find out more about what you're doing and keep up with your upcoming adventures? Sure. Yeah. On Instagram, I'm always active there. It's the.world.hiker. Uh, on YouTube, I've made a lot of videos from different countries I've been to. It's The World Hiker as well. On YouTube um, website, theworldhiker.com, Facebook, The World Hiker as well and uh always active on those and i feel like uh one more thing i wanted to add like for this community to go from endurance or outdoor sports into travel it, it's a natural transition like a lot of the things the like, same qualities you use for these sports when you put it into budget travel endurance travel like y- you anyone who does these outdoor sports is, would be a great fit for someone that could love traveling and so i feel like the, the two naturally kind of you know mesh together it's a lot of discipline, a lot of sacrifice, and a lot of patience and mm-hmm. uh, pers- persistence. So Enjoying the journey, right? Yeah, Enjoying yeah. the journey, it's not just the destination the or the wow. finish line or the summit. Well, well, geez, Brian, I am I am stoked. It almost kind of makes me upset that we did this during this coronavirus thing because I'm ready to buy a plane <laughs> ticket, honestly. <laughs> I, I would be too. I got spring break coming up in a week and a half. And... I can't go anywhere, you know, so I got to have a local adventures here in the Sierras and in California or on the bike trail close to home if I have to be. So. Hey, you're, you're, you're in a world destination to me. Exactly. Yeah, it's, so, it's a good place. I so appreciate you being on and taking the time and sharing your story. It was incredible. Oh, well, thank you for having me on. And thanks for the work that you do. And seriously, you help a lot of us out when we're in our kind of darkest moments on the road to have that sense of community. It's, it's huge. So thanks for all the effort you put into the podcast. Oh, it's returned to me. I do it for y'all and y'all do it for me. It's, it's great. So, all right, man, well, we'll talk soon and I'll let you know when it comes out. Okay. Sounds right. good. Thanks so Brian. much, Mason. All right, Alrighty. First of all, Thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun.